This presentation will take a look at conditional uses and special exceptions. First, let's start with some terminology. Generally, Wisconsin statutes and courts use the terms conditional use and special exception interchangeably. However, local communities may define and use the terms in different ways. If a community uses more than one term, they typically say conditional use to refer to uses of a property, while special exceptions refer to small dimensional changes such as height, setback, etc. I've also seen a community use the terms conditional use and special exception to assign the review work to two different decision-making bodies. For every zoning district, there are typically three types of uses, permitted uses, conditional uses, and prohibited uses. Permitted uses are uses that are listed and allowed by right in all parts of a zoning district. These are reviewed and granted by the zoning administrator. Conditional uses, sometimes also referred to as special exceptions, are uses that are listed for a district and may be allowed if suited to the location. These can be assigned to one of three bodies, the plan commission, the zoning board, or the governing body. Lastly, we have prohibited uses. These are uses that are either not listed for the district or that are expressly prohibited. Each zoning district contains a list of permitted uses and conditional uses. Shown here is a sample table that you might find in a zoning ordinance. Along the top of the table, you will see each of the districts used in the community, for example, residential, commercial, industrial, etc. Along the left side of the table, you will see specific uses. Then, the community will typically use letters, colors, or other designations to show which uses are permitted, conditional, or prohibited. To be considered, a conditional use must be listed for the zoning district. Decision criteria for approving a conditional use must also be listed in the ordinance. For example, the use is compatible with surrounding uses, it does not harm public health, safety, or welfare, and adverse impacts to the environment or surrounding areas can be mitigated. In addition to general criteria that apply to all conditional uses, you may include specific criteria that apply to certain uses. When granting a conditional use, conditions may be attached. For example, hours of operation, fencing, lighting, parking, or vegetation requirements. If there are conditions that you frequently assign to a given use, I recommend that you include them in the ordinance as a condition of approval. There are many ways to develop conditions. If you have conditions that you frequently attach to all uses or certain types of uses, we recommend that you include them directly in the ordinance. You can also solicit input as part of the public hearing. Input may come in the form of a staff report, town recommendation form, or simply through concerns raised by citizens. The decision-making body has ultimate authority to decide what conditions are attached. Conditions must meet two tests. The first is the essential nexus test. Basically, this means that any conditions you attach must address expected project impacts. Secondly is the rough proportionality test. This means that the conditions must be proportional to the extent of the impacts generated by the development. Let's take the example of a large retail store. As a condition of approval, you could require the property owner to construct a retention pond to contain all stormwater on site. Assuming the stormwater pond is sized to accommodate the runoff generated by the development, this meets both tests. The retention pond addresses an expected project impact and it is sized according to the extent of the impact. There are a number of options for ensuring compliance. You could require recording of the conditions on the deed. You could require compliance reporting by the owner as a condition of the permit. For example, they could come in on a periodic basis or upon sale of the property. Zoning staff can maintain a database and periodically check for enforcement. And you could also require a cash or surety bond for projects that involve significant capital outlays. For example, mitigation, construction projects, etc. Unfortunately, most communities follow the last option here, which is do nothing and wait for complaints. In a recently published decision of the Wisconsin Court of Appeals, a zoning ordinance was modified to eliminate a conditional use under which a permit was already granted. In this case, the court found that the existing use became non-conforming and the conditions could no longer be enforced. This is something that's important to consider if you are updating or considering changes to your ordinance. Not only was the use allowed to continue free from conditions, but it was also afforded certain protections under the non-conforming use law. The review of conditional uses and special exceptions is considered a quasi-judicial decision.
This means that decision makers act like a judge, reviewing the facts of the case and determining if the applicant meets the standards of the ordinance. They have authority to attach conditions to the permit to address expected project impacts. Quasi-judicial decision makers must also follow the rules of procedural due process. This includes holding a public hearing, providing notice, and making an impartial decision. They should also keep a record of their decision, including the process, decision standards relied upon, and rationale for their decision. This is helpful in case a decision is ever appealed. If you have additional questions on this topic, please review Chapter 14 of the Zoning Board Handbook or Chapter 7 of the Plan Commission Handbook. Thank you for listening in.